Well, hello and welcome to church for Sunday, December 20th, 2020. A couple of announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, we're continuing to hit pause until further notice. We're watching the hospitalization numbers and the, and the COVID case counts. Things are going in the right direction, so hopefully those numbers will continue and we'll be able to, uh, to regather soon, but uh, we're keeping a close eye on those numbers. The financial needs of the church continue during this time. So if you're able to give, that would be much appreciated. You can give a variety of ways. You can give through the church app, the church website, mailing a check to the church. However you would like to do that, we would appreciate those gifts if you're able during these difficult days. Also want to make sure, sure that you know that if you have a special prayer request to let me know. I spend time every day praying through the church directory, lifting any requests that I'm aware of. And uh, so if you've got a special request, please let me know, and I would be happy to lift that request for you. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for us and for the privilege that we have to gather, even in these crazy, difficult days, in the midst of what has been the worst year of most of our lives. Thank you that we can still gather and still be encouraged by the message of your hope and your peace and your joy and your love. Father, as we gather together today, I know that there are a lot of people in our congregation that are struggling in a lot of different ways. And so we lift those to you for those who have had physical procedures this week and perhaps waiting for that healing to take place. For those who are facing uh, procedures, medical procedures, for those who are, are dealing with the impacts of COVID, both current cases and those who have lingering side effects. Father, for those who are wrestling with the reality of isolation this holiday season and not being able to, to travel or to be with family the way that we're used to, I pray that in each of these situations that you would, that you would be present and meet the needs of those who, are, those who are struggling. And Father, I thank you that in the midst of these days that we can turn to you and know that you hear us and know that you care. I pray, God, that you would guide us, that you would speak to us each the message that we need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we move into this fourth week of Advent, you can see that now all four of the, uh, the smaller candles are lit, representing hope and peace and joy and now love. As we enter this sermon series, we, we started talking about what Advent is, and, and it's not just Christmas, as uh, many of us have been taught. It, Advent is, is a celebration that the church has embraced for many years, a celebration that, that reminds us to anticipate. Now, when this first started, Advent first started, there was a, a sense in which the world knew how to wait, but we don't know how to wait very well in our day, in our culture. We get so impatient with everything, whether it be shipping for the presents that are being shipped from halfway around the world that should have been here yesterday, or whether it's anticipation for this vaccine to, to be available to more people or for this pandemic to be over. We don't anticipate well. We rush and we push and we tend to get things when we want them. Well, at least we did before 2020. But 2020 helps us to understand that need for anticipation in Advent. It's also a time of looking forward to Christ coming. It's a look back at His first coming, but it's the anticipation of His coming again. A reminder that we are participants in a bigger story than just what we see unfolding in the world around us today. Advent is a recognition that things are not yet as they should be. The world is broken. The world is a mess. We are much in need of a Messiah. And it is a reminder that when the Messiah comes again, that all will be made right. All the brokenness, all the pain, all, all the suffering will all come to an end. And all that is wrong in the world will be made right. And as I've joked every Sunday, this series, Advent to us is a reminder that 2020 isn't going to last forever. 
we are going to get through these difficult days. The world will be very different on the other side of them, but we'll get through these difficult days. In Advent, there are four themes that we focus on. Hope, peace, joy, and today, love. There's also a fifth candle in the Advent wreath, and that is the Christ candle, which is to be lit at the celebration of Christ's birth. Well, this week in our reading, we've been in the Gospel of John and we're entering the final dinner. Now, it's typically called the Last Supper, but I call it the final dinner here just to, to get us thinking a little bit differently. Sometimes when we hear the, the Last Supper, we tend to think of just communion, which is an important part of, of our, our theology and our, our sacramental system within the church. Or we tend to think of da vinci's painting the last supper but i want us to think of this more along the lines of a, a final dinner rather than the last supper just because i think it helps us to see it a little bit differently in our minds now john's gospel was the last gospel that was written and he really wrote to to fill in the details of what the other gospels had left out granted if if any of us, if four of us were to experience something together and we all sat down to write down our accounts, the story would come out different. Different things would appeal to each one of us or different things would, would help each one of us. And that's certainly the case with the Gospels. Matthew really emphasized the teachings of Jesus and, and those analytical details. Mark really emphasized the actions of Jesus. He went here and he did this. Luke emphasized the compassion of Jesus and, and his reaching out to those who were down and out. But all of those three Gospels together still miss some things, and that's what John wrote to, to fill in. Now it's interesting, John gives more time to the final dinner or the last evening that Jesus had with his disciples than any of the other Gospel writers. He gives more time than Matthew, Mark, Luke. He actually probably gives more time than all three of those combined but he doesn't mention the meal he talks about everything else that they did which reminds us that he's not trying to to tell us the same story but he's writing to fill in the blanks in john's gospel this final dinner discourse this this last discourse starts with john 13 and actually the the events of that night go to john 19 but the conversations go from chapter 13 through chapter 17. They had gathered to celebrate the Passover meal, which was a sacred meal or festival that the Jews would celebrate each year to remind them of their story. The story that they had been enslaved in Egypt and they had been brought out to freedom. Miraculously, God delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. And they were to remember that several times a year. Last week, I believe it was, or the week before, one of the two, we, we talked about Hanukkah and how, I was on a Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago trying to get my story straight here. We talked about how Hanukkah came from the festival of shelters or the festival of booths, which actually was the, the reminder where they were supposed to spend a couple of days in a tent every year to remind them of their journey in the wilderness but Passover reminded them of how God miraculously delivered them from the Egyptians. This was celebrated with a very special meal, with lamb being the main course. Lamb that had been first offered as a sacrifice to God, and after it was offered as a sacrifice, the, the lamb was given to each family, and they would take that lamb and prepare it for their meal. Each family was to bring their own lamb with them, and everyone who lived within walking distance of Jerusalem was expected to come and celebrate this meal within the city walls to, to remind them of God's protection and God's deliverance for them. But practically speaking, they walked through the streets with their lambs. Did I mention that there were probably about a million people gathered in the streets? Not every person had a lamb. There was one lamb per family, but there's still an awful lot of lambs running through the streets. And, you know, lambs weren't potty trained. The result of this is that the streets were rather messy. And that creates 
an interesting predicament at dinner that night. And, and that's what I want us to focus on. So let's open our Bibles to John chapter 13, starting with verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now that he loved them to the very end. I'm going to read that verse again. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over doesn't need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. That's when he, what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their masters, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now, we have here a case of stinky feet. Stinky feet because... This was in the day before automobiles. This is the day when humans and animals would walk the streets together, and washing feet was an extremely important activity before you would sit down at the meal. Because one of the other things, and, and the reason I'm calling this the final dinner rather than the last supper, the last supper actually has the disciples sitting on chairs. The painting by da Vinci. But at the actual final dinner, the Jewish people didn't sit on chairs. They reclined by the table. The table just sat slightly off the ground and, and they would lay next to each other. And as they would lay next to each other, my nose would be right next to this person's feet. So washing feet in a day when the animals and the humans walked the streets together was a very important task. And someone forgot to coordinate this job. So they sat down for dinner and started smelling each other's feet. And you can imagine how that went. They recline at the table and they take the deep breath to celebrate the fact that they're together for this special event. And oh my goodness, what did you step in? And it was very distracting. The smell was overwhelming and likely it was making them nauseous. Now, this was a special celebration. This was a, a major feast every year, but this time, because this time Jesus had called his disciples together, Luke's gospel says, I was very anxious to celebrate this meal with you. Jesus did not want this night to be impacted by dirty feet. He really wanted to use this night to, to speak into the disciples' lives. They needed to hear what he had to say because he knew what he was going to experience in the coming days. He knew what they were going to experience and how much they needed him. Jesus wanted their full attention and he knew that they could not hear him if they kept smelling each other's feet. So Jesus demonstrated love. 
John describes the scene that unfolded and almost as if it were happening in slow motion. As I was reading this this time, I, I just felt like you, you almost heard John felt that time stood still as he watched what was happening. Jesus didn't stand up and condemn somebody, whoever it was that was supposed to coordinate the foot washing, most likely Peter. Jesus didn't condemn, he just started fixing the problem. John tells us that he got up from the table and he took off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and he began washing their feet and he dried them with a towel around his waist. As we read those words, I can almost see John as he's writing these words down, reliving that moment and and my guess is that when Jesus stood up and took off his robe and wrapped a towel around his waist and people started to realize what was going to happen, that Jesus was going to wash their feet. This was the job for a servant. And, and typically there was a servant that would meet you at the door and wash your feet. That's what Peter probably forgot to coordinate. And time stood still for the disciples as they watch Jesus stand to do this task. John introduced this scene with a powerful phrase. Jesus had loved his disciples, and now he loved them to the very end. That love was demonstrated through Jesus washing their feet. Now there is this side note in the story where Peter really reacts negatively to Jesus' actions. He says, Jesus, you're going to wash my feet? I don't think so. And what that tells us is most likely Peter was the one who forgot to arrange this task. He was the one who failed to, to get the servant there and it was his fault that Jesus was now washing feet. And Peter certainly wasn't going to do this. He's not going to wash those Remember, Peter liked to argue that he was the greatest. And so when Jesus came to him, Peter was like, you ain't washing my feet, I'll wash my own feet. But Jesus challenged his reluctance. And Peter, although he was a bit dramatic, he eventually received the gift. Jesus then challenged his disciples as he sat back down at the table. He says, if I have washed your feet, you should wash others. I have given you an example, so do as I have done. So how about 2020? The world's a little bit different now, thankfully. We sit in chairs, so even though somebody may have stinky feet, we don't smell it as much as we used to. We drive automobiles, and so we don't walk the, the streets with, with stuff all over our feet as they did in that day. And we have indoor plumbing available to us. If we do step on something, then, then we can wash our feet off ourselves. So washing feet is not as much of a, a priority for us today most of the time we wear socks and shoes and even if something does get on our feet we recognize that we leave the shoes outside the door the specific act here isn't as much of a priority but we're still living in a world where love is desperately needed now when i say this i'm not talking about a hollywood type of love the i'll love you until i find someone better I'm talking about true Christian love. Love that finds its, its pattern, its example in the person of Jesus Christ. It's a love that looks beyond oneself. It's a love that's not afraid to get dirty. 
It's love that does not consider itself above a task. It's love like Jesus showed. It's love like the Apostle Paul described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to challenge you as we wrap up our time together this morning to open your Bibles to John or to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and read that chapter to see how Paul described love. This is the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated to his disciples. And it's the kind of love that we as followers of Jesus Christ are called to show to one another. So what is Advent? Advent is a recognition that things are not yet as they should be. Advent is a recognition that, that everywhere we look in our world, things are broken. Things are messy. Advent is a reminder that all that is broken, that all that is messy, all that is not as it should be will be made right. But Advent is also a reminder for us to love as Jesus loved. To love in such a way that, that the world doesn't experience its brokenness in isolation. It's a love that says that, that when things are not as they should be, even though we as the followers of Jesus Christ can't make everything better, we can help people experience the love of Christ in the midst of their pain. And we trust, we trust that all will be made right. It is demonstrated in the here and now through our love for one another. But it will de be demonstrated throughout all eternity because of Christ's love for us and what he did for us in the cross and the resurrection. So Advent reminds us that it's not, everything is not right in this world. It will be made right. But until it is, we are to love as Jesus loved. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I recognize that this week of Christmas will probably not be like we're used to experiencing. But I pray that you would find ways to reach out and love the love of Christ to others. And I pray that you receive the love of Christ to encourage you and strengthen you during these difficult days. May God bless you and Merry Christmas.